Welcome to OIA Conversations, where we share information and learn more about people, programs, and issues that are important and relevant to the U.S. territories and to the freely associated states. I'm Tanya Joshua, Deputy Director of Policy and Communications Lead in the Office of Insular Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior here in Washington, D.C. Today, I am joined by Dong Cho, the OI, our OIA field representative, who is based on Guam. Today, we are speaking with Ms. Stephanie Flores, administrator of the Guam State Clearinghouse, which is essentially charged with oversight for all federal funds that come to the government of Guam. Stephanie, welcome and half a day. It's a pleasure to, to see you today. Buenas well, and half a day. Good morning uh, or good evening where you are. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. So please tell us a little bit about the Guam State Clearinghouse and the role that you play for the government of Guam vis-a-vis -vis federal funds. Okay, so the Guam State Clearinghouse is an independent office that's under the direct supervision of the Lieutenant Governor of Guam. Um, so we don't report to anybody but the Lieutenant Governor. Um, and our role in the government is to be an independent compliance section. So we review all of the federal funds, uh, federal awards, be it grants, loans, uh, any kind of federal aid, including emergency funds that come to the island of Guam. Looking over your budget, uh, that's something that we can, that the public can, has access to. Uh, it looks like it's roughly 25% of the overall Guam budget. Would that be an accurate uh, percentage? Um, actually, it's a little more than that. So on a yearly basis, we have about $450 million in federal funds available. This is during a normal fiscal year, not in a pandemic year where we've had extraordinary uh, federal support. So in the, in the last fiscal year, we had you know close to $1.2 billion in, in federal aid that came to the island when you when you include all the federal pandemic unemployment insurance, all the CARES Act funding, all the um, increased uh, funds and awards that were given to the different agencies uh, to respond to the pandemic. So please um, give us a, a, a little bit more detail into how, how do you conduct your oversight? What does that, and how many staff do you have? What does this look like? Okay, so, um, in order to effectively manage and oversee um, that tremendous amount of money, right? Um, what we do is we do a uh, monthly reporting. Um, we have access to the financial uh, system for the government of Guam. And we monitor on a monthly basis all of the accounts that are set up through the government of Guam system. And uh, we break it down by agency, grant, object category, um, and we monitor from month to month, make sure that, that folks are spending their funds. And then at the same time as a cross-reference, uh, we require all of the government agencies that receive funding to report to our office on a quarterly basis, every grant that they've got um, and what their, their progress is. We ask them for their spending plans uh, to make sure that you know, they're consistent with what they've told their grantors. Uh, we also want to make sure that they're effectively spending money so that we can reduce the amount of funds that get returned. Uh, you're speaking of uh, funding that, that gets returned. Could you give us a little more? Is that, what, what does that, uh, how much is returned in a year approximately? Okay. Um, it varies from year to year, uh, but it's not uncommon for uh, states and territories to return part of what we call formulary funds. Okay. That's funds that the federal agencies uh, provide to Congress to every state and territory or, or community uh, based on a formula, uh, based on population or whatever it might be. And some of these funds, you know, um, don't necessarily match with, uh, with the actual needs of the territories. For example, uh, we get some um, funds for cattle. Uh, you know, like, like cattle ranchers might need. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not necessarily something we would need here, but we get a portion of it and we try to use it as effectively as possible. Uh, we might not be able to use all of it. So uh, what we try to do is to make sure that that award, the amount that is given back 
um, is as minimal as possible. So when we're given money, our, our goal is to make sure we spend it, right? So think about it this way. When you're, you go to your rich uncle and you say, uncle, um, I need $50 because I need to, to buy corn to feed my chickens at the farm. And you try to be as good at spending that $50 as you possibly can. And you figure out a way to spend less, right? Less than the $50. You come back with $20 and you say, uncle, here's $20. I didn't use all of your money. And your uncle looks at you and says, well, either you didn't know what you were doing when you asked me for the money to begin with, because you didn't really understand your program, or you just didn't know how to spend the money and you didn't use it wisely. And so we agreed that $50 was reasonable. You didn't use it. So next time I'm not gonna give you what you asked me for. I'm gonna give you way less than what you asked for. And you might actually need more later. So um, when we get these funds, we try to make sure that they spend as much as possible in the correct manner. Meaning you stick with the program guidelines, you make sure you spend it um, and you get it done correctly and on time. The idea of asking for an extension on time is not something that we agree with. If they give you a time period to spend the money, spend the money in the time period, right? So if you got three years to spend it, don't wait till the third year to start moving on your program. Start getting it done, doing your planning. Um, when you asked for the money to begin with, you gave a plan and you said, I'm gonna do these things in this time period and, and stick to it. Uh, there was an article in uh, the Pacific uh, at the Pacific, from the Pacific News Center recently about the Guam, the Guam deficit nearly uh, being nearly eliminated. It was in yes. May last month. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So um, over the last two years, um, the deficit has reduced. Uh, in 2019, the beginning of 2019, the deficit stood at around. $86 million. The general fund deficit was about $86 million. Um, and then by the next year, we had it um, down by about half. And then in this fiscal year, what we've been able to do is, um, or the at close of last fiscal year, it's down to about 1.6 million. This is just the general fund um, deficit. Okay. And the way that you know we've attributed that significant decrease in just such a short period of time was by increasing federal spend, meaning increase more effective use of our, our federal dollars so that there's a larger um, percentage of intergovernmental transfers. Intergovernmental transfers is the amount of money transferred from the federal government to the local government um, by federal grants and reimbursement. So when we were better at that, um, you clearly could see the general fund deficit went down. Um, it's, but it's not all, the only reason, but it is a huge, huge factor in, in how that was, it, how we were able to achieve that, you know, through good fiscal responsibility and making sure that, you know, the fiscal responsibility of the government of Guam includes effective monitoring of our federal spend. That's how we're able to do it. Um, the governor and Lieutenant governor um, gave very, very clear instructions two years ago or two and a half years ago, which was don't return the money, spend it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been doing. And uh, it's, there's been a lot of um, improvements and we're finding ways to improve even more. Um, we know that a, a big challenge for us has been procurement. Um, there's more than enough blame to go around. You know, people like to think that it's just the procurement uh, agency that's the problem, but we know it's not. It's, it's um, a need for training, a recurrent training of our line staff, program staff. Um, it's a need for training at procurement. And it's a need for more um, personnel in the, in the general services agency at, at the government of Guam. So, you know, we've advocated for, for a lot of those changes um, and, and we're advocating for more changes just so that we can become a more efficient uh, government and so that you know we're more transparent about how money gets spent that's that's a big deal for us is making sure that you know we spend money we spend it correctly and we do it on time 
the, the idea of asking for no cost extensions and, and, and that we're trying to minimize that for when you really actually need it. Right. Now, uh, congratulations on reducing that deficit. Uh, I believe we spoke at some point about the uh, bond rating for Guam. Did that have an impact on Guam's bond rating? Yes. So with the, with the positive outlook for our finances, obviously that has a, a tremendous impact on our, our creditworthiness and, uh, and our bond rating. And, and, the, and the bond raters have, have uh, listed Guam as stable, right? And when everybody else is being listed as, uh, uh, you know, not so good, right? Not so favorable um, outlook. But for Guam, we were able to get, you know, a stable outlook. And, and, and that's 100% due to the governor and lieutenant governor's fiscal responsibility, the fiscal team, um, and, you know, our everyday employees who are doing their part to make sure that government is doing what it needs to do and delivering the services and understanding that we need to run a little more lean and um, get things done correctly. You know, we've been criticized a lot for a lot of things, but tell you honestly, it all comes out in the financial documents, right? It all comes mm -hmm. out with credit raters and, and everybody from outside looking in saying, no, you're not doing a bad job. You're mm -hmm. doing a pretty good job. Uh, which federal agency would be the biggest uh, partner that you have on Guam who provides the, the greatest amount of funding? The greatest amount of funds right now, I would say if it's just direct aid into the agency, it's HHS. HHS. So, okay. Yeah. Health, so and Human Health and Services. Human Services. That's the, the largest bulk. I mean, Department of Public Health and Social Services receives the, the, num the largest number of grants, the lion's share of the grants for the island. And for obvious reasons, that's where the grant funding really is, is you know, Health and Human Services. Um, so they, they grant to a number of different agencies, not just public health, but they grant to behavioral health, um, this Department of Integrated Services for Individuals with Disabilities, so through SAMHSA grants and, and other grants. So, you know, the children and family services, those are all huge, huge pots of money. Um, child care block grants, those, those, are, those are really where we are. And then the other, if I had to say the next larger group's got to be HUD mm -hmm. or um, Department of Labor, the USDOL, there's lots of money coming in from USDOL. Uh, deal on a regular basis, not just, you know, if you were to take away the federal pandemic unemployment, uh, U.S. DOL still is a, is a very, very large grant for. Now, this is, of course, separate and apart from Department of Defense, right, and all the military money that's flowing either for the buildup or um, just, you know, DOD personnel on island. So, you know, that's, that's completely separate. You know, that's, you know, we get our what we call Section 30 funding which is the federal taxes paid by uh, federal employees on Guam and, and military uh, service governors on Guam. Uh, during their tax year, it gets uh, remitted back to Guam so that we use that for a large part of our funding. Right. So if you take those two pots away, uh, the largest is, is still HHS by far. And thank you for that clarification because uh, the military does have a big uh, role on Guam. Yes. Um, Perhaps my colleague uh, Dong Cho might have a, a question that he would like to add. Not really a question, but then just hitting back on the comment about um, how you know Ms. Flores works uh, to make sure that the government of Guam doesn't lose out on you know grants, right? Uh, one of the experiences that I had with her earlier on was um, Guam gets a grant for coal mining by the U.S. Department of Labor to Guam. It, doesn't make any sense where there's no coal mining that happens on Guam. It actually shocked me when when U.S. Department of Labor reached out to our office and said, hey, um, Office of Insular Affairs, can you help us resolve this issue that we're having with the Guam Department of Labor uh, regarding this coal mining grant? And, you know, I reached out to Ms. Flores and she was extremely helpful and we were able to, you know, link up the two <coughs> agencies um, so that they weren't going to be losing the funding. So um, it's something that, you know, I, I, I really um, pride myself on having a very good working relationship with Ms. Flores because we've been going back and forth, dealing with multiple uh, federal funding issues, um, um, especially from our office uh, that goes into mm -hmm. the government of Guam. So uh, she's had definitely been a very big asset um, for us 
in resolving some of the problems that we've been having um, regarding the technical assistance program or like the capital on um, the CIPs. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. Now you've spoken about uh, situations where funding is coming to you that, you know, coal, that that's irrelevant to Guam. What about the opposite direction of perhaps where Guam needs a certain funding that, that maybe the federal government doesn't quite have a, a grasp of, it doesn't quite fit into their, the federal sort of image of what funding needs to be made available for? Well, you know, know, obviously a big area that we've been working on, and I know that OIA and um, a DOI has been very, very supportive of is the Medicaid program, mm -hmm. where the territories are treated differently um, than, than the states. We've got a different way of calculating uh, Medicaid caps, right, um, and how we do matching. So on, on a regular basis, it's a 55-45 split, right? Federal government pays 55%, and the local government's got to come up with 45% for the match. That's a lot of cash when you think about it for a government, you know, governments the size of, of, of the governments that we have. Now, there have been recent um, efforts in Congress to correct that, and we're very happy to see that the Biden administration has, has taken the position that, you know, okay, we're reforming this. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be more equitable. It's gonna, we're going to change the FMAP to where it's closer to the 85%, seven, uh, you know, 15% that's available in most states, right? So um, that's the, one of the biggest things. And then one of the other big things is, you know, we have the COFA migrants and <clears throat> Guam and Hawaii host the, lar the lion's share of, of the, the COFA migrants. Guam, especially because we're the closest, right? We're the first stop. And um, so it has a tremendous impact on services that we provide here. And when um, during the pandemic where they reverted to allowing COFA migrants to become Medicaid eligible, right? That's a huge, huge thing too, because also it's not, it's not just that they're eligible because it's also that it's a separate pot of money. It doesn't come out of the same pot of money um, that we would have for the, the rest of the local population that needs it, right? Mm -hmm. And just by you know our demographics, we are an underserved population when it comes to Medicaid, right? Uh, Pacific Islanders, Asians and Pacific Islanders are, are very, very underserved in the healthcare field, right? So when you, you add that to the COFA, you know, add the COFA migrants to the mix, it creates a huge strain on our, our um, hospital system and our public health system, right? And both, both hospitals, the, the local Guam Memorial Hospital and the Guam Regional Medical Center, right? They both accept the COFA migrants as, as payers. And so they're both Medicaid certified and they're able to take. So the fact that they're now, you know, we're, we're doing things so that it, it's a greater source of funding, it, it, it's so much better. And this affects our medically indigent program, which is set up locally to cover people who are not insured or cannot be insured because they're either they're, they're not working or they don't make enough money to afford private health insurance, our medically indigent program comes in and, and, and takes care of those people. So that's 100% local expense. And so now with the reform to the Medicaid rules um, and the allowances to, to make changes to our state plan, that has a tremendous impact on, on quality of care um, and, and really getting us to points where we're, we're not just, you know, doing emergency care and then avoiding re-hospitalization, right? What, that's what we're really trying to do is have better managed long-term care in terms of um, diabetes and, and physical therapy and things like that that are needed to stave off um, re-hospitalizations. Yes. Well, that's a big, big area where we really need to help is that we get a tremendous amount of money from HHS and we get a tremendous amount of money uh, for a lot of things, but to hit at the main root of the problem where we can start making huge strides for long-term benefits, it's really the, the recent reforms in, in Medicaid um, that we've been asking for for years. Yes, I can't recall that uh, the legislation uh, right on the top of my head, but it was passed at the end of last year. So really uh, just very recently. Yes. 
So uh, I'm very so, glad uh, to hear that yeah. mom has uh, opted yeah. to, to take it. Yes, at one point, um, the COFA migrants were allowed to, to be part of Medicaid and then that was, the rules were changed and then they weren't. Um, and that caused huge impacts, not only in Guam, but in Hawaii as well. Um, and so really Hawaii took the lead on, on really championing it. So Senator Hirono was really out in front uh, working with our delegate, uh, Sir Nicholas and, and Delegate Sablon from the CNMI, really pushing, really, really pushing to, to make this happen. The other area that we really need a lot of assistance in is um, housing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's a double-edged sword, right? Because you've, we've got the military, right? And, and they contribute greatly to our economy, but at the same time, their overseas housing allowance drives up the average price of rental property. So you don't really, you, you, our affordable rental market is almost non-existent, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and, and you can see Dong uh, uh, shaking his head, he's just absolutely correct, is that, you know, as a landlord, if I'm gonna be able to charge more for rent by waiting for a military tenant, I'm going to do that rather than, you know, you've got three or four local families who couldn't afford as much because they don't make as much Right. As the the single military guy who's you know gonna come in and pay me two thousand dollars a month for a one bedroom apartment, right? I mean, it it really does skew a lot of things. So um, HUD's been really good at giving us some you know there's good programs, <clears throat> but at the same time it it doesn't address the the more systemic problems of of just not being able to have an affordable rental market. Um, or affordable housing. And when you talk about affordable housing, it really isn't very affordable. Um, you've you've got to make, you know, what is the average income for a family is what, 40,000? And, and you can't, you know, you just can't afford a house. So you've got to have, you know, two or three generations of, of your same family in your same house to afford rent, mm -hmm. right? Which is, is, is leading to another problem that we have with the emergency rental assistance program, right? It's a fantastic program and it's got a great intent, right? But when you try to apply it locally, mm -hmm. you have the problem of, I got three or four people in my house receiving pandemic unemployment insurance. I might be the person on the lease and I might qualify on my own, but the ERA program requires that everybody in the house, your income has to be counted. And the minute you do that, you no longer qualify. Mm -hmm. And so there's been lots of issues with, with that in that regard. And you know, just trying to go back and forth with HUD and, and Treasury to say, hey, look, this is the real problem here. You know, this is a fantastic program. We've got $33 million sitting because we just can't get it out to people because they can't qualify under the, under the guidelines, which would work, you know, which do work, you know, uh, for most of the people in the state because Let's face it, right? In the States, you're 18, you're out on your own, right? In an island community, you know, just like where you're from, where we're from here, that's not the situation, right? You know, you stay with your parents until you're married, right? <laughs> you know, it, it's just the way it is, right? You, and, and then, of course, because of our rental market is such that you can't afford it. People cannot afford to move out. Right, you've got all this, you know, you've got lower paying jobs, you've got, you know, a whole bunch of different things that factor into the fact that you cannot afford to live anywhere other than your family home. Right, right. Right, and so you, you're aggregating all that income, doesn't help, doesn't help. But we do know that pandemic unemployment's ending in September, and we're kind of bracing for that. What are we gonna do um, to help these people because it's, I think that's when we're going to see a huge flood of, of that uh, ERA money go out because they're not going to be able to, if they're not, if they can't get uh, reemployed, they're going to all of a sudden become qualified overnight. How is the, um, not to, not to distract too much from, from Guam State Clearinghouse, but in terms of the economy and COVID, uh, how is that, how has that been affected Guam's economy and workforce, workforce situation? Yeah. Well, um, because a very, very large portion of our 
economy is tourism based. So uh, hotels have had to shut down unless they've become quarantine facilities, right? For either the local government or the military because the military mm -hmm. also did quarantine, right? So you've got um, those hotels, but even then the, the staffing requirements for that is, is pretty low because mm -hmm. of the, it's just, it's a quarantine facility. So you don't necessarily have, you don't have the banquet staff. You don't have all of those other things that you would normally have. So there's a large segment of the population still not working. Yes. And so what they're doing now is we're, we're shifting and we have a lot of uh, retraining grants that are happening, right? Department of Labor um, has got a whole bunch of retraining grants. We're doing boot camps so that people can learn a new skill, a new trade that's more uh, what, what, what we've seen pandemic resistant, right? You need construction workers, you need tech people, you need truck drivers, you need, you need these types of jobs uh, where there's a real shortage of manpower. And um, so that people from the tourism industry are getting trained. They're going and they're taking these classes and, and they're getting a new skill. They're doing things that they probably didn't think that they were gonna do. And it's opened a lot of people's uh, minds to what to do, to make sure that they are in the next pandemic, you know, hope God willing, we don't have another one, but you know, you, you get a job that's pandemic resistant. In terms of our, you know, the pandemic unemployment insurance has helped stabilize the economy. It really has. Um, the income tax, the W-1s that we would not have received had people just been completely laid off um, is offset by the fact that you, you, you can take W-1s from the pandemic unemployment, right? It's like 10% um, is able to be paid over uh, so that the people receiving un unemployment are still filing taxes, right? Mm -hmm. So that tax base is, is, is still there. It's been able to offset um, some of or mitigate some of the losses that we would have had. That hasn't offset it completely, but it has mitigated it. Um, and then just by the nature of our the fragility of our island healthcare, we've had to close down a lot of other things and, and keep them closed, right? Mm -hmm. We've had to limit um, occupancy in restaurants and the types of businesses that can open and retail and and all those occupancy limits necessary to keep the pandemic the the Healthcare situation at a, at a good level um, have caused you know people to become more inventive about how they do business. Um, restaurants are doing takeout and and that's becoming a a huge part of their their new model, right? They, how they're going to go forward, the indoor and outdoor dining um, as an option for people who didn't have outdoor dining before has become a you know the a way that they can stay open is now have outdoor dining. So it's changed the economy considerably. We're very resilient. The islanders have to be resilient, right? You get all kinds of things from typhoons to natural disasters to everything. So you've got to figure out a way to, to come back and come back better. Um, and so I'm very, very proud of our people for being able to do that. It's just adapt and overcome and come back stronger. And 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 they've been doing it. And and you know, and understanding that it's for everybody's benefit, right? To to just come back better. Um, and there's a small group of people who, you know, are very vocal in their complaints about the regulations. And, but for the most part, most people understand it. Most people want the regulations until we're at a point where we're safe, um, from a healthcare perspective, because, you know, 139 people died from COVID. And mm -hmm. if you ask any one of those people's families, all the regulations are necessary all the regulations are necessary. You know, everything else is secondary. The economy will get better. We'll, we'll spend more money, we'll make more money. You can always make more money, but you can't ever bring people back, right? So doing things the right way, the economic recovery um, will happen and it's being planned methodically so that it's, you know, it's resistant and we make in, investments into the future so that when things happen, it, we minimize the impact. And OIA has been great, has been a great partner in that, uh, making sure that we do things to address economic recovery as well. Think about things, not just for today, but what are you gonna do so that your economy is better going forward? And OIA has been a great partner with that. And congratulations to Guam for um, you know, vaccination efforts, uh, <laughs> all the insular areas and, and Guam has been 
uh, a leading uh, leading in that area of uh, getting the numbers of people vaccinated, uh, getting those numbers. So congratulations to Guam and, and your resiliency. We're speaking with Ms. Stephanie Flores, administrator for the Guam State Clearinghouse on the island of Guam. Um, Stephanie, you talked a little bit about uh, training as we close. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more of some of the programs that have worked uh, and where maybe some of the needs still might remain. Well, some of the things that, that have worked really in terms of training is any kind of training we can get to improve efficiency, uh, technical training. Um, for example, when we get training for, for grants management, right? Just a lot of program people forget the basics, right? You, you've been doing the program for so long you forget to go back to the basics and say, okay, this is how I'm really supposed to do things. My reports really have to be on time. This is what has to be in my report. It prevents a lot of back and forth with the grantor, right? When, when you start out at the beginning, knowing exactly, you know, you speak the same language that your grantor speaks, right? Mm -hmm. You um, make sure that you answer their questions, not just fill out a report for the purposes of filling out the report. Check the box, I did the report. No, but did you give them the information that they really needed to evaluate your program? So grants management training has been huge. I mean, real grants management training, that's, that's been huge. Um, another thing that, that will, will help in the future is, is uh, recurrent training for our accounting staff, our budgeting staff, um, just to keep them up to date and make sure that, you know, changes to the yellow book are followed and, and everybody understands you know all the internal control mechanisms are extremely important um, that's something that's very very important for this administration and we know that when we have better internal controls there's less waste and you actually return less money um, when you when you're monitoring all along the way and you're making sure that they're spending so that's you know those are the types of things strengthening our professional staff in that regard giving them the training that they need so that our accountability, our transparency, and our efficiency improves, go through the roof. That's what makes our government better. We get are able to deliver services more timely, and we're able to deliver services in the way that the people will expect, so that we can increase the expectations of our general public. Um, they will become uh, more used to expecting more from the government, right? They expect a certain level of service rather than, you know, it's very common to say, oh, that's the government, you're just gonna have to wait and you're just gonna have to accept the fact that you're gonna get bad service from the government. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to change that completely, change that mindset. Uh, and we start with the staff, uh, you know, our everyday employees changing the mindset of that's not acceptable. Bad service is not acceptable. You gotta do your job and you gotta do it right. And you got to be happy about doing it, right? And, and so it also reflects on us too. What are we doing to make sure that our staff is equipped? They've got the right kind of tools that they need to do their job effectively. Because sometimes they're not happy because we can't, we're not giving them the training that they need. Or we're not giving them the right equipment. How can I expect somebody to do an efficient job when their computer's 12 years old? Right? It just doesn't make sense, right? You know, the, the, if you talk to the professional staff, they will tell you. I need an upgrade in financial management systems. I need an upgrade in my equipment. You know, it makes no sense for me when I can do a better job on my cell phone than I can at my office computer, right? That doesn't make sense, right? And um, those are the types of things that the governor and lieutenant governor really look at. They really, really sit there and they really say, how can we make this better? What can we do? What kind of trainings out there? Can you please go find the training? Can you please go find the money? to make sure that these people can do it. And sometimes it's just a question of, okay, when you write your grant proposal, can you put in some money for training? Mm -hmm. The grantor will approve it if you put it in there and you say, this is why I need it. And this is how it's gonna make your program better. If I can continue to train my people, I can be more effective at this program and we can achieve the program goal, right? Mm -hmm. Grantors will, will agree to that. I mean, they really, that's what I found is, if you talk to your grantor, you're open with your grantor, they will help you write your, they will help you write your submission so that you, you both achieve the goal so that we're both on the same page and we all have the same goal. We all want this program to work. So how can I make sure from the beginning that it's gonna happen, right? That's where we're at. 
Thank you very much for your time. It's very good to know that you are working, that our field rep, Dong Cho, is also working closely with your office and that there are good relations on the ground there uh, on the beautiful island of Guam. Uh, any, any other final words you'd like to share before we, before we go? Um, you know, just thank you to OIA for, for the support you give us. And, and really it does make, I mean, it might not look like it, but it really does, it makes a huge difference. Um, a lot of people don't understand what you do, but I will tell you that when you don't do it, we feel it. <laughs> okay, that, that, and, and that's the best way I can, I can describe it is that nobody really understands what OIA does, but when you aren't doing it, everybody feels it. So um, thank you very much for, for your time today also and, and, and for helping us, you know, improve our islands and our government in the best way we, we possibly can. Thank you.